I'm Dave Palumbo, founder of Species Nutrition. From my earliest bodybuilding days, I believed in only putting the best in my body. And that lives on in the Species Nutrition line of products. I put my name and reputation on every bottle of Species Nutrition products. If you want to be your absolute best, join the evolution. Hey guys, we're super excited to be here at the LA Fit Expo. It's our third year in a row. And uh, what we're going to be doing today is we're going to be launching a tasty pastry. It's a low carb Pop Tart. It's got three to four grams of net carbs. And we love this show. This is our best place to be in LA. RX Television on RxMuscle.com. This is Ask Dave, better known as Hashtag Ask Dave. Your 30-minute question and answer show with Dave Palumbo. All your questions, diet, training, supplementation, IFBB, pros, news, whatever's on your mind, it is all on the tables. We now bring a Dave Palumbo. Dave, as we were just talking right now, this came across our news feed. Really, really cool. Uh, scenes from Egypt where Big Rami must have just arrived back home um, in his native Egypt. And for the second year in a row, uh, you're getting a taste of just how appreciative the local fans over there are of um, Big Rami, of his second Olympia win. Um, we saw scenes from fans waiting at the airport and then him getting a proper parade, like a literal parade through the streets in Egypt yeah. uh, with fans, adoring fans, just you know, wanting to get a wave or a picture or whatever with him. You got, you know you have to put it into perspective. All right? They don't have like NFL football teams there or basketball teams really. So bodybuilding is probably one of the biggest sports aside from maybe soccer there. You know, so when your countryman wins the Mr. Olympia, it's like you know Michael Jordan winning the NBA championships here. And so it really shouldn't surprise anyone that Ramy is getting this you know like king's welcome here because it's a very big deal for them. And you know. Think about how many Egyptians have ever won the Mr. Olympia. None. So Rami's it. He's two-time Mr. Olympia. So they're going to definitely, you know, hold him up in high regard. And I think, uh, you know, it makes sense when you put that into perspective. I think a lot of people don't realize how important it is. And if I hadn't gone to the Middle East myself back in the 90s, I would never understand what this uh, obsession of theirs is with bodybuilding. But they love bodybuilding. The shake of, you know... Dubai in 96 came to watch the bodybuilding show and came and said hello to us. I mean, I mean, it's, that's how important it is. It would be like the president of the United States coming to a bodybuilding show and, and shaking the hand of the, of the the people that were at the bodybuilding show. You, you can't understand it until you go there and experience it. So um, good. I'm, I'm very happy for Rami for the win. Obviously, I'm happy that he's you know getting a lot of accolades for it. I'm happy that hopefully financially he's it's paying off for him as well because uh, the guys worked very hard to get where he was. It took him a lot of years to actually realize his, his true potential, seven years once he kind of hit the pro scene. And now he's, uh, he's cashing in, which is great from an from a acknowledgement standpoint, but also financially. And this is going to set up his future, hopefully. You know? and, uh, look, look at that scene right there, Dave. I mean, we were joking about this earlier before we went on air. I mean, again, you, you just discussed the, the love and the passion that the – Middle Eastern fans have for bodybuilding. I know we had King Kamali on uh, yesterday for Heavy Muscle Radio, and he's often talked about, you know, how just fanatical they are in uh, his native yeah. Iran uh, for bodybuilding. And <laughs> we were joking about, like, you probably would not get anything close to that here in this country. No, I mean, no, different not at all. Cultures, a different appreciation you know, I, for bodybuilding. I went their, to Dubai in 96, videos. Sid, and they took me out. I never paid for a single meal. They would take me to a restaurant. I've told the story before. And they'd actually bring... I, I was eating fish because I was dieting. They brought me a whole fish. They're like, which fish do you want? So I said, well, that one. I, I didn't know they were going to make me the whole fish. They made the whole fish for me. They filleted the whole thing up right in front of me. They took us to the Nike outlet. They bought us free sneakers. They were throwing anabolics at me, like like in bags, as if I could take it home with me, which I couldn't, obviously. <laughs> so, I mean, that that's how much they're into the into the sport of body. The bodybuilders are like superstars over there, and, and they really respect, you know, mass and size and people who are able to achieve a certain level of development. And it's good. You know, it makes you almost want to stay there. You're like, holy mackerel, I'm like a celebrity here. And so yeah. 
I understand why a lot of guys in bodybuilders have moved to Dubai now and actually train there because they're treated they're treated special as opposed to here you, you you're treated as a criminal they want to arrest you for 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 looking big. Good for Rami. We got a chance to speak to him before the Olympia to meet the uh, meet the Olympians, and he just spoke so candidly about what it meant to him to see yeah. you know his country, the Egyptian people, the Egyptian bodybuilding fans, and really the Middle Eastern region. You know, so happy to see him, uh, you know, achieve what he has and, you know, the kind of, you know, accomplishment and what that does in terms of influencing, you know, an entire generation of bodybuilding fans and aspiring bodybuilders in that area. He spoke very proudly of that. So good for Rami. Continued success. Let's go to the questions. The first question from the Dave Palumbo Experience app. Dave, if the last Sunday for a next Saturday competition is your fine, good condition, rip, fine, etc., is it necessary uh, for carb depletion, carb load, eliminating salt, or keep the things same as you did to achieve that kind of condition? For for like a show the following week, is that what they're saying? Yes. Yeah, so last last Sunday you had a show, and then for next Saturday, assuming yeah, I, you were good. I repeat show, yeah. the same the same protocol that I did the week prior, assuming it worked. In other words, if you came in too flat, I might feed them more carbs. If they if it came in too full or maybe spilled a little bit. I might cut it back a little bit. So assuming that everything worked perfectly for the Sunday show and then they have the Saturday show coming up, that next day I do legs on Monday morning and you know deplete down again and then fill up again. And that, I mean, unless the person is absolutely shredded and even though I, I usually give people a cheat meal the night of the show, if he wakes up Monday morning and he looks absolutely crazy dry hard i'm gonna i'm gonna feed him more leading up to the second show because i don't want him to get super flat i might not need to deplete him down that much it really is a you know a case by case situation where you have to assess you know the person you're working with um i have a guy this who's competing this weekend who is competing on uh, on friday night and then he has another show like another division on sunday night so I mean, that's a weird thing because then on Saturday, I have to let him eat and kind of redo what I did on Friday, on Thursday night for him again on Saturday night. But I'll probably feed him more because he's going to be super crazy rip dry from the diuretics and from not drinking. I'm going to have to give him more fluids and kind of repeat the whole situation again. And once again, it's going to go hour by hour. He's going to be texting me pictures. And if I think he's too flat, I got to feed him more and give him more liquids. If I think he's too full, I got to, I got to cut him back on the fluids and I got to use a little more diuretic. And that, once again, that's where a coach comes in so you can kind of, you know, walk the person through that. Let's go to our Instagram questions. Again, if you're not already following us on Instagram, the handle is official underscore RX muscle. If you're watching us for the first time on YouTube, welcome. Please hit the subscribe button, hit the notification bell. You're not going to miss any of our show segments, uh, any of the content that we have coming up uh, throughout the course of the week. Let's go to D Shribs. Uh, question is on Proviron. Does first of all, does Proviron lower SHBG, uh, sex hormone binding globulin? As second, is it a still still a good choice for someone looking to add uh, during a cycle if they already have low SHBG? You know, he, back in, in the '90s, people thought that Proviron, because Bill Phillips told us that in his anabolic reference guide, they thought Proviron was an estrogen receptor blocker. We all did. We would take Nolvidex and we would take Proviron before a show because there was no Arimidex back then or Femara or Aromacin. There was no aromatase inhibitors. There was something called Teslac, which is an aromatase inhibitor. Very hard to get and very expensive. I actually used it once because I, I had a good connection for it. But needless to say, when you think about... I just, I, the question just blanked from my head. What was the question, Sid? <laughs> uh, let me go back to it. <laughs> it was on another account. Uh, it was about, I guess, uh, you know, the relation between Proviron and... Oh, Proviron. Uh, Pro all right. Yeah, thank yeah. you. Thank you. I got too carried away with Teslac. I got a little excited when I heard Teslac. But then we found out, you know, more recently that Proviron is really supposed to be something that increases or displaces drugs from the sex hormone binding globulins, which are the, you know, the proteins in the blood that inactivate steroids. So, like, if you take a certain amount of testosterone, a certain percentage will be bound to those those binding proteins, the, the stuff that's not bound, we call free testosterone. Um, it, theoretically, if you take proviron, it's supposed to displace or basically get, it's supposed to bind to these binding proteins and, get, and take the steroids, the good stuff, and, and release it and make more of it free. Theoretically, that's how it works. I don't believe it works like that. I've, I, I just, just haven't seen proviron provide the results that it should. Because theoretically, if it does that, if you take it all the time, you should grow better, right? Because you have more, you have more 
testosterone and other anabolics available. And I don't just, I don't see it. I just don't see it. So um, I'm not sold on the whole proviron thing. I would, I tell people not to use it. Cause you know what, when, when there's an unknown variable there that I can't prove that, and I can't see results from, I don't want to muddy the water. As a matter of fact, what I'm afraid of with proviron is that it's going to bind to androgen receptors in place of stuff like trenbolone or DECA or testosterone and not allow those other things to work. Because we don't know what it binds to. We think it binds to the binding proteins. What if it does bind to the androgen receptor? And we know that proviron has no anabolic you know, qualities to it whatsoever. It's completely an androgen. So it might make you a little stronger, but it might actually prevent you from growing. And that's my fear with the whole thing. So I just tell people don't use proviron. We're getting quite a few questions um, about Sean Clarita, obviously competing at this weekend's Legion Festival. Um, Dave has a separate video that is live right now on our YouTube channel. Um, then the other question about Derek, uh, we'll school with that one. It's from Neil Zalewski. Derek Lunsford, uh, if, and he told us after the Olympia that he is going to talk to Hani Rambod, uh, they will discuss whether or not the move is next year to go to the Open uh, or to stay in the 212. He did express interest in eventually one day being an Open competitor. Simple question. If he did Open, how do you... The question is how would he plays. I would rather frame it to you in terms of how do you think he will do immediately and then in terms of growing into his physique. To be honest with you, if... Derek Lunsford waits much longer. He's, his window of opportunity is going to be gone. He is young, but he's not that young anymore. The, these years go by very fast. He better make the, the move you know, sooner than later, I think, or he's, going to ne- he's not going to be able to make the move. Uh, that's a, a situation I've seen happen before with other competitors. The guys that are the most successful, like the William Bonax, are the guys that went right into the open. All right, you know what? We did one year in 212, and then we, we're leaving. We're going into, we want to be open competitors. So if he's holding back his growth during his, his peak years where he's going to be doing all his growing, and then when he hits his 30s, he's, going to be, he's not going to be able to grow anymore or he's going to be at a much greater disadvantage. So he's got to make that move like this coming year. You know? um, he might want to just you know, hang out in the 212 and just win that a couple of years. I don't know. I mean, there's nothing wrong with that. He's not going to make as much money. He's not going to be you know, probably as popular of a pro as a 212 as he could be as an open, especially if he does well and wins shows as an open guy. So that's a personal decision that Derek's got to make. Hey, do I want to go all out into the open and put on 20 pounds of muscle? Or do I want to kind of just chill here in the 212? I am the champ now. I could probably win it, you know, a couple more years. Um, But I'm not going to really be able to grow much from where I am because I'll never make the weight anymore. So that's a personal decision for Derek. If he were to do the open next year, and he was able to put on 10 or 15 pounds, which I think he's capable of doing at this point in his career, I think he could win shows. I'm not saying he's going to win the Arnold, but I think he could win local shows, you know, you know, like Chicago or something like that, because he's got a big structure. He's not the tallest guy, but he's got a big structure. Big structured guys that are really wide do well in the open. It's the narrow guys, like, you know, talk, and we're going to mention this about Sean Clarita. Clarita's a little narrow. He's freaky as hell. He's got crazy round, you know, crazy body parts. I think he's going to have a lot of. T- he's going to have a very tough time in the open because he's not structurally as big as some of these other guys. Even though he's short, he's not that wide. So he'll have a much tougher time than a Derek Lunsford will. I think making that transition. I think that Derek will be very successful in the open. He might not win the Olympia, but I think he he could work his way up into being a top five guy for sure. Uh, let's go to Sugar J Fitness. I know you touched on this yesterday on Heavy Muscle Radio. Uh, your thoughts on Milos taking over uh, as Regan Grimes' coach, and in general, what is your uh, assessment of the potential that Regan Grimes had two years in a row on the Olympia stage? Well, you know, Regan is still growing. You know, he remember he had that little hiccup when he kind of went backwards for a couple of years, where he wanted to be a, a classic physique guy, and he had Aceto suck him down, you know, twenty five pounds to make the weight. And then he kind of was dilly dallying a little bit. He wasn't sure what he wanted to do, so he kind of lost two years, I think of growth, which, you know, it's not the end of the world because he is a young guy. So I think now he's just working on putting that size on necessary. We know what Milos does. We know Milos has come on, given us his protocol. He's giant sets, insulin. You know, Regan's going to blow up, have a nice rebound off, the, uh, off that Olympia. He'll probably come into the show at the Legions this weekend, you know, with another, you know, maybe four or five pounds of muscle, fuller, obviously, more volumized. Um, I still think his legs need to come up. I don't think Milos is going to be able to fix that issue. 
However, if he works with Milos or he works, you know, over the next year or so, he's got the structure to do really well in the open class. He's won pro shows. He's made it to the Olympia stage. He just needs to get bigger because the guys on the Olympia stage are a lot, are, are just more massive than he is. And that's the problem. But he's got a good shape and he, he can get in really good condition as well. He just needs more muscle. So I don't necessarily know if he's going to do that much better this week. But it's also not a stack lineup. It's not the Olympia lineup. So he should be a top five guy for sure, I would think. Um, as long as Milos brings him in dry, you know, and not tries to bring him in too, too full without losing some conditioning, he'll do well this coming weekend because the lineup is not crazy. You know, Sergio is probably the biggest name, I think, that, you know, at least the, one of the names I'm looking for to possibly win the show. But Regan should do really well. He should be a top three guy for sure. And then if he works the whole year, whether it be with Milos or anyone else, I think that he can certainly put another 10, 15 pounds on. And if he can do that, now he's a dangerous guy. <laughs> Let's go to Chester Brown. Uh, do you have any advice on how best to use vanadyl sulfate to aid muscle replenish replenishment? And does it stack with creatine? Vanadyl sulfate is like taking insulin. The problem with it is that it, it's very um, hard to define how much to use. Because you're taking something orally and you don't know how much you're absorbing of it. I used to use it when it first came out in the 90s. And I used to feel the pump on it. And you know what? Sometimes if I would take it and not eat enough carbs, I'd go low blood sugar. So it definitely has an insulin-like effect to it. And, and, and it's not an insulin sensitizer. It actually acts like insulin in a sense. So if you're going to go to the point where you're going to take a supplement that actually acts like insulin, yet it's very hard to figure out how much to use because... Well, I'm eating 10, uh, 20 grams or 30 grams of carbs for this meal. How much vanadol should I take? And you can't really define it. I'd rather just use insulin at that point because at least with insulin, you could say, okay, if I take one you know, unit of Humalog, I need to eat 10 grams of carbs with that. It's definable. Uh, if I'm going to take in 50 or 60 grams of carbs, I take five to six units of Humalog. That's a, a lot more definable than saying, all right, I'm just going to you know, guess with the vanadol sulfate. So I guess if you want to you know, stay, quote, natural, you know, you can use that at all, but it's going to be a trial and error process for you to see how much, how many grams of carbs you need per dose of Vanadol. And I can't give you a number on that because everyone's different. Uh, Tyler, I'm going to ask you to bring up uh, someone on Instagram, Brandon Hendrickson. So Brandon Hendrickson, of course, uh, this past weekend, uh, won the men's physique division at the Yamapo Yamamoto Pro Cup. Um, so the question actually was not, I'm kind of looping him into this question. Somebody asks, you know, from lag, no excuses. If somebody wants to have a body like men's physique, do you still need to train legs? But when um, Brandon Hendrickson won that show and, you know, posted his picture holding up the trophy, you saw the conversation. The conversation was all about the fact that it's his legs are big. He is bigger. Uh, and it seems as if now the direction of men's physique is bigger uh, and he being the face of the division now, having won three of the last four years. Um, Dave, do you see, first of all, if you want to answer that question as far as the necessity of training legs for men's physique, but then when you assess Brandon Hendrickson in the direction of men's physique, is it getting bigger and you're going to start to have some blurred lines between men's physique and classic physique? Well, you know, the guys have definitely gotten bigger over the years, no doubt about that, but there's still a lot of guys that don't train their legs or, or you know, train them hardly ever, you know. Uh, Brandon always, you know, I've interviewed him innumerable times, and he always said that his goal in the back of his head at one day was to go to the open class. I don't know if it still is. So he always trained. He always had legs. People don't even realize that. Brandon always had really good legs. Um, I think now the, the board shorts are a little tighter fitting, and they're a little shorter, so people are starting to see his quads more so when they used to wear those big baggy, you know, board shorts that kind of hung down like you know, like, like, like a diaper almost, <laughs> or, or they were just too big. I thought, I think the new ones are the, the way they're wearing them now is much better. So I think people are seeing his legs, but there's a lot of guys out there that have great physiques, huge upper bodies and still no legs. So, and no calves, um, they're not judging legs and calves. Okay. So Brandon didn't win because he has the best legs and calves. In addition to upper body, he has the best upper body. And that's, you know, that's, that's what they judge on that class. Do I like the fact that he trains his legs? And he's got legs. Absolutely. I think these guys should wear the classic, when the classic physique first came out and they had like those, the Arnold like posing trunks they kind of wore, it was, it was kind of like almost like spandexy shorts. That's what the men's physique guys should wear. So you see their legs. 
The classic guys should just go into posing trunks at this point. There's a, defi- there's a definite separation between men's open and classic. The separation has nothing to do with the trunks they're wearing. It has everything to do with the weight per height. So we got a, a, clear, a clear delineation. Let them both wear posing trunks. It's bodybuilding. Put the men's physique guys in, in, you know, in, in shorts that you're going to see their legs and let the judges judge the legs. What the hell? I don't understand what, what the problem is here. They're not hitting poses. They're just standing. But their legs balance their upper body. I mean, it should be a complete body assessment. That's, that's my belief. Um, I do like where it's going now. I like the fact that Brandon's got legs. But right now, according to the criteria that they judge, you don't really need legs. Let's go to Andre Adams official. Drop some knowledge on the severity and dangers of harsh loop diuretics like Lasix. Also, what is it with sight enhancement uh, and synthol? I mean, it's a totally different question about. Let, yeah. Let's ask, answer the first one in terms of harsh loop diuretics like Lasix. Mm-hmm. Um, what are some of the dangers that maybe right. people don't know about that they should know about? I've said this probably a million times now when talking about diuretics, every time someone dies from diuretics, I, I do the same diatribe and people, some people listen, some people don't. There's only one diuretic that you should be using out there, okay? And it's more than effective enough that you don't need any other one, and that's diazide. Now there's different generic versions. It's two drugs. It's hydrochlorothiazide and triamterene, okay? There's a version in Europe called Modiretic. It's, it's, it's um, hydrochlorothiazide and um, amylaride. It does the same thing. One, the hydrochlorothiazide is, 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 is forces potassium and sodium out of the body and thus water. The triamterene makes you retain potassium, so the combined effect is that you only lose sodium and water. If you take too much of the stuff, okay, and you start cramping, the only thing that, that, that could possibly be wrong is that you have too much sodium loss. You've lost too much salt in your body, and you just can consume salt and you fix the problem, okay? It's a very simple... Um, fix if anything goes wrong and it's very very definable in the sense that it doesn't work too fast but it works fast enough that you you it's very predictable in how it works it, in other words it doesn't work more better on certain people and less on other people it works pretty consistently um, the other options diuretic wise would be your strong strong loop diuretics that have no um, potassium sparing effects that would be your Lasix or also known as furosemide Demodex and there's, there's other ones out there as well Okay, those just, the problem with them is that they work, but a lot of them work too fast. And sometimes when you work, when you pull water too fast, sometimes it comes out of the muscle too. So you can flatten yourself out really quickly. Um, Also, because they pull sodium and potassium out of the body, if you do cramp, okay, which happens a lot, okay, to people, you don't know what to put back in. Should I add sodium or should I add potassium or should I add both? Um, if you have enough potassium and you add more, you can make the, di- the, the, the cramping worse because now you're putting a potassium overload. Potassium overloads cause death, okay? We don't want to do that, okay? So it's less fixable. The third option is what we call aldactone, which is a purely potassium-sparing diuretic. And a lot of people, for some reason, like to use it multiple days. And I'll tell you why. If you read the package insert, it's actually been, it give, they give it to women who have androgenic side effects from whether anything, from, from natural hormone production or from taking steroids. They give it to them because after 10 days, aldactone acts like an anti-androgen. It actually blocks the androgenic effects of, of, um, uh, of steroids or testosterone in their body. So if women are getting like hair loss or thinning or they're getting, a, you know, breakouts or hair on their face, a lot of times they'll give them aldactone to inhibit that. So for some reason, people took that 10-day or 7-day um, you know, um, effect that this aldactone has on anti-androgenation, and they applied it that that's how you have to use the, uh, aldactone. But you really don't. I mean, if you used aldactone for one or two days, you'd get the same diuretic effects. You don't need to use it more. Matter of fact, more is not good because it actually acts as an anti-androgen. The problem is that if the longer you're on aldactone, the more and more you're building up potassium in your system. Because remember, it's potassium sparing, okay? And the problem is, okay, because it's potassium sparing, if you cramp on aldactone, you don't want to take more potassium. And you don't want to eat potassium-rich foods like potatoes and bananas because, which is what a lot of guys do, they eat a lot of uh, potatoes, because that makes the potassium overload worse. And if you get too much potassium in your your system, you can stop your heart, okay? So you don't want a lot of potassium. 
So actually the antidote for too much aldactone is actually to give someone Lasix to actually push the potassium out of the body. And that's something that a lot of people don't understand how to fix. So it's not an easy fix. Also, if you cramp on aldactone, okay, because you're losing sodium too, okay, you can't reabsorb sodium because aldactone blocks the hormone aldosterone. And aldosterone's job is to reabsorb sodium and water. So here you are taking this mild, what you think is a mild diuretic, okay, you're accumulating too much potassium in your system, you're losing sodium, you start cramping, you don't know what's causing the cramping, so you try to eat salt, but you can't absorb the salt because you've blocked aldact uh, aldosterone in your body. Meanwhile, so you say, well, maybe it's a, 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 I'm eating salt that's not fixing it, let me take some potassium, which is the worst thing to do because now you're overloading your body with more potassium and you can stop your heart. So both diuretics, the, the strong loops, and the aldactone are not good options. Do people use them all the time? Why? Because they don't understand the simple science of this. Diazide is all you need to use. And if you can't lose enough water, the water you're holding or you think you're holding, prior to a show, within 24 hours, then something is wrong. You're doing something way, way wrong, okay? Because it only takes 18 to 20 hours to really dry out, you know, efficiently. And I think you can do it in 12. So. Really, you shouldn't be taking diazide any more than 24 hours before a show. Having said that, will, everyone, will people listen to me? 50% of the people listening here will say, that's ingenious, I understand it, I'm going to listen. The other 50% will go and do exactly what they were doing before, and they'll have the same problems. That, that's the reality of the situation. There you have it, your entire guide to the dangers of loop diuretics and aldactone. That's what was part two? What's that? What was the part two of that question? Well, the part two is about um, SEOs. Um, let's see if I can. Oh, yeah, I wanted that. to say and something about that too. Basically, like, you know, look, this Simple. has been a talking point now for the better part of the last yeah. week, week and a half now, right? With SEOs, yeah. injections. So it, if I could if you out, inject, listen, yeah. this is, there's, a, there's a very easy answer. It's not going to take me a long time to do this. If you inject synthol, testosterone, DECA, trenbolone, or nilotyl, esiclean, it doesn't matter what you inject into a body part. It's the same effect. It volumizes the muscle. These people do this because they want to create bigger arms or bigger calves or bigger shoulders. So when people say, I don't inject it all on my shoulders, well, you're injecting something in there, okay, that's causing scar tissue buildup or leaving a lump in there for whatever reason. So it doesn't matter what you, stop with the semantics of what you're injecting. You're injecting something in there. We know that. We see it. The judges know that that's going on. If it looks bad, okay, because you're a bad artist at what you're doing, you're going to be marked down for it. If you do it right and don't overdo it, okay, and no one can see that there's something in there, okay, or obviously misshapen or weird looking angular type stuff in there, then you're not going to be marked down for it. That's the way it works. Don't pretend that there's one thing better than another that you can do. Just don't do things in excess, and I guarantee you, you will not be penalized for it. When I see a bodybuilder out there who's got like an angle in their shoulder, whether they did it on purpose or not, it doesn't matter. It's the same effect. People, the judges see this. They don't need Dave Palumbo or Chris Asuta to point it out. It's obvious, okay? Everyone sees it, and it's going to hurt you. If you fix the problem and don't do it again, then, then, then there's not going to be a problem. People are not going looking for it again, okay? So just understand that that comes with the territory people do this anyone who pretends that they don't inject body parts is a liar okay just be a good artist so i mean that was essentially the question as far as like the direction that is taking bodybuilding and especially if it was such an obvious talking point um you know coming off the no Olympias. one's stopping doing it everyone will continue to do it it's it, that's part of the sport so that's going to do for this episode of As a Reminder right now on the channel. Dave talks about uh, Sean Clarita competing in the Open this weekend at the Legion Sports Festival. And, of course, all new episodes of the Heavy Muscle Radio and a hilarious, hilarious yeah. flat earth debate. <laughs> <laughs> Jimmy the, the Bull Earth's versus life. SpaceX engineer <laughs> collide. Who's going to come out on top? You'll have to watch it. For Tyler Short and Dave Palumbo, I'm Sadiq Faruqi. We'll see you next time.